it's created kind of a bifurcation where what the military is talking about, at least right now, is 2004 to present. But we know that this phenomenon goes back a lot longer than that. And then we're not sure how much longer. Right? Let, me, Maybe <clears throat> let, me, let me stop you there because that, you raise a very interesting point. In, in, in reading the DNI report, the Director of National Intelligence, which is this office set up after 9-11 to coordinate um, the intelligence to the president from 17 different intelligence agencies, good grief, talk about bureaucracy, talk about government inefficiency. Can you imagine trying to sort through 17 different agency reports to get what's, what's signal and what's noise? Anyway, so the DNI office is supposed to do that. When I read that report, the thing that, that really struck me is, again, that first paragraph where they talk about the threat, not potential, not possible. They simply said the threat of, well, to have a threat, you got to have an adversary. If you're not considering ETs to be the adversary and you're not really considering China or Russia to be adversaries or Iran, because as you said, the backward nature of, of, of our adversaries right now in terms of conventional technology, then what's left? I come back to the Emily Dickinson perspective, you know, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Are they talking in veiled terms about the breakaways? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, it's... You know, what, what does strike me as interesting, and I guess this this might sound a little conspiratorial, but I did hear someone say, done. I don't remember where it was, but I, I do recall on a radio show or something like that, somebody said a while ago, um, UFOs will make a comeback after a war in the Middle East. They said that, you know, that the government always has to have a threat, right? They said that's the next one. They said after the Middle East thing wraps up, then it'll be aliens. And I remember at the time hearing or reading that, I remember thinking to myself, yeah, right. Yeah, right. You know, but here we are. I mean, we're pulling in Afghanistan, and at the same time, you know, we're, we're reading about alien threat, I guess. So, you know, that brings up a very interesting thing, and we're coming uh, down to the bottom of the hour, so I want to pick this up on the other side. But I've been watching this incredible, precipitous departure from Afghanistan in a way which is as messy, certainly for our interpreters and all the Afghan folks that helped us for that 20-year war. It's as messy as our departure from Vietnam. It's like we learned nothing. We're leaving these people in the, in, the, in the lurch, in the dust. That's not what we should be doing. And so why are we precipitously leaving? Is it possible that there is some other factor that as part of this extraterrestrial equation, right. the and UAP phenomenon, right. We are responding to some kind of orders from someone on Turn high, right. get out, or, again, just kind of putting that out there. You're on the other side of midnight. My guest this morning is Tim Ventura. Keep right. And we're exploring and the straight big on. picture implications of the official U.S. government stance now. Go straight on. That UFOs, UAPs, whatever you want to call them, they Keep left real. and then turn left. And what is that going to usher in? God turn left. No. Get ready to turn right. Turn right. Turn left. Here we are, safe and sound. The other side of midnight.com. Talk radio with pictures on demand.
liberate your hyperdimensional time scale and non-linearly access over 400 hours of conversation at the cutting edge of science and thought. Time to hit the road. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive content that fits your interests and time schedule. Filter episodes by guest or subject. Membership costs $9.95 a month, $0.33 cents a day. Talk radio Turn with right. pictures on demand. The other side of midnight.com. Turn left. Get ready to turn right. And welcome back, turn everyone, right. on this Sunday night, July 11th, Keep 2021. Right. And then turn right. We're talking about the UAP report from the defense. Turn right. Uh, I'm sorry, the director of national intelligence. The potential for hearings. Keep right. In the Senate and then and turn House right. Intelligence committees and what this is going to do to the whole Turn idea right. of extraordinarily advanced technology. Um, I presume, Tim, Keep you've left. got some more analysis. And then turn left. Right? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I think left. I burned through probably all of my best quotes, but, um, well, I, I guess, what should I touch on? I guess that would be where I would, where I would start. Well, I've seen Keep very left. little analysis and then turn uh, from left. the Navy. You know, there's been basically the videos, the clear videos. Turn there's left. been the commentary. There's that, that uh, uh, 60 Minutes interview with, you know, a couple of the pilots. But I haven't really heard numbers as to the extraordinary nature of the technology. What I'm really looking forward to, if they do nothing else in these hearings, that they simply lay out these numbers like vehicles moving at a thousand G's, which would obviously smear any human pilots, you know, into a thin gelatinous you know, layer all over the inside of the cockpit. I mean, right there, how anyone with a straight face can maintain this is some adversarial secret technology that the Russians or the Chinese or Iran are using to tool around, you know, U.S. carrier battle groups. I mean, the whole thing on its face is ludicrous. But Washington is the seat of a lot of ludicrous positions. So maybe there are folks that uh, will actually buy the idea that these are secret Chinese weapons. Yeah, well, I, I think you're raising an important point, right? And so and those kind of G-forces are not practical unless you've got inertial modification, right? Like, if you can if you can nullify inertia, Keep um, then you can get around that. But if you're if you're using any kind of conventional aircraft or rocket or anything like that, those I mean, not only would those G forces liquefy highly, but they would destroy an airframe itself. So, you know, the, the problem is, um, and again, these craft don't they don't just move linearly. Right? You can't just write this off and say, well, it's some hypersonic this or hypersonic that, which is, you know, that's what the top of the line Russian missiles are working towards, is they want to be able to fly two or three times as fast as the older missiles can. Keep well, left. that's all well and good, but they can't do a U-turn at that speed, and UAPs can, and that's the difference. The difference is the kind of maneuverability they have. You know, another thing that a you know, hypersonic missile can't do is it can't be flying along enormous speeds and dip into the water. And I was just going to say, you remember that wonderful, because it's so camp, it's kind of wonderful, uh, a television show, A Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and, and they have this little flying vehicle that they would, you know, move out from an airlock under the bottom of the uh, sea view, this huge, re ultra, you know, research nuclear powered submarine and it was, you know, the flying sub or whatever, and it would depart and then it would leave the water and it would fly to like New York and then it would come back. And then at full speed, it would dive into the water. Now, Irwin Allen, you know, was a genius when it came to writing imaginative fiction,
But of course, technologically, that was dumb. That was stupid. That was, you know, the thing would basically splinter into a, a zillion pieces if you tried that. These yeah, craft the are doing this routinely and then moving underwater at hundreds of miles per hour as tracked by sonar. And again, any country on Earth that had this technological capability in hand as a developed technology would own the planet. Well, exactly. Yeah, and you're you're touching on another very large subject, and it's been speculated that UAPs are using the ocean to hide, right? I mean, the, the ocean covers 70% of the Earth's surface, and we do have submarines and, and listening devices and all sorts of military stuff out there to detect and deter. You, you know, know, the social Russian network subs, in the North but, Atlantic comes to mind. Yeah, but at the same time, the ocean is pretty much the perfect place. And and again, speaking from a, a somewhat paranoid perspective, one of the things that got me, that, that still troubles me, is um, when you look at where these sightings happen, right? Like uh, a hotbed of these sightings is Catalina Island. Well, Catalina Island is right off the coast of Southern California. So if you are, if you're some kind of a UFO or something, um, hiding in the water there gives you ready access to an enormous population center, but keeps you, I mean, you know, it prevents them from coming back to you, right? As opposed to something like a mountain, you know, a mountain people can drive there, they can fly a plane, a woods, people can drive there, they can fly a plane, you know, people, people have access to it, but the ocean, especially if you're underneath it, who knows? So, you know, the same thing I believe was on the East Coast, I believe that was, uh, you know, off the coast of a major population center, it does it does give me pause. I guess it makes me wonder a bit about about motive and intent, which I think we haven't really determined yet. Keep See, I think that's an important and then point exit because right. I, as you, have been privy to all these stories going back decades. Exit. Grays, right. you know, abductions. Um, I was uh, <clears throat> very fortunate to. Uh, have had a chance to spend time decades ago back in, uh, I think it was 60, 65 or 66 with uh, Betty and Barney Hill. And I was the first one to realize, I believe, the significance of the 3D star map that Betty described during one of their, their abductions where they were shown, or she was shown a star map and the captain or the head of the uh, crew on the on the uh, vehicle that they were on Goes straight uh, asked her if she could identify where they meaning the sun the solar system were on the map and I took that little nugget and I called uh, someone that I had just barely met by the name of uh, Alan Heinick and he, that was right. the uh, in spur for him to come east and to uh, together with a professional psychologist to have Betty and Barney Hill uh, hypnotized and regressed and have Betty draw the star map under hypnotic regression. And then there were articles and I think Sky and Telescope ran a feature on it or whatever, but that came out of my almost chance discussion with Betty that night about some of the things that they saw in this craft, which in 65 were light years ahead of anything uh, in either the, you know, open aerospace community or even in the so-called uh, uh, deep black world of top secret projects. Well, so I, I guess I, I would ask you then what your thoughts are on, and again, this, this goes to this bifurcation between our modern story of UAPs, right? We're talking glowing orbs and what looks like glowing propane tanks, big oversized ones. That's the modern story versus this incredible history of UFO sightings. I mean, again, you know, I mean, there are Renaissance paintings, it looks like. Um, you've got even Egyptian hieroglyphs may have them in it. So we've got this really long history of mythology. We're not sure what's true and what's not there. Do you well, think that the greys are real? Do you think that we're dealing with a physical bipedal humanoid? I don't know, because I do know that uh, psychological Reroute. manipulation, deep hypnosis, I mean, 
the astronauts were on the moon, right? We had many, many crews on the moon and in orbit. Not one of them Find remembers a, new route. a stunning set of artifacts they saw on the moon. I had a debate, uh, you know, bringing right. back Art Bell with uh, Ed Mitchell on our show one night, three hours. And uh, while Mitchell, you know, was so redolently uh, effusive on the idea of UFOs and, and Roswell and all that, where of course he never was, uh, he was on the moon where there are all kinds of ET artifacts, real physical things that we can see in the imagery, and he didn't remember anything about those. And uh, I believe this is an example of mind control, a technology which was developed again by the Germans, by the Nazis in World War II, that basically can plant or alter human memory and can wipe out experience and basically um, uh, inculcate a script. Um, and Mitchell himself was kind of a witness to that. And then I went looking for other astronauts and their commentaries on their Never experiences mind. on the moon. I'll find a new and group. I found a common, a common commonality <clears> that I put on. in uh, uh, Dark Mission because it seems that all of them had had their minds tampered with in a way that almost was like right. the original impressions right. and sensorium and, right. and experiences had been suppressed and a turn synthetic right. script had been overlaid okay. where they Let's could tell you timeline, chapter and verse, we did this, we went to station number five, we took out the tongs, we loaded up samples, we did the drill, all that stuff. But Mitchell himself said he was at a public event and some kid, 11, 12 years old, whatever, stood up and said, um, um, uh, Dr. Mitchell, what did it feel like to walk on the moon? And he started to answer and then he stopped. And he wrote about this later in one of his books called The Way of the Explorer. Just Google that. Ed Mitchell, Way of the Explorer, because he said he suddenly had this shocking realization that whereas he could remember all the stupid metonymic stuff, the experiments, the equipment, the traverses, the geology and all that, he could not remember, he could not get in touch with what it felt like to be at the peak experience of his life of his career, um, a human being walking on the moon. And it so bothered him and increasingly bothered Sorry, him that ultimately he wound up reroute. seeking professional psychological... I said safe travels. I know the players, I know who was involved. On. I can't talk about it tonight. I know what the sessions read out like and every time the hypnotherapist tried to get him to get in touch with the experience, he would say things like, oh, that's not important. Oh, we don't have to go there, you know. Deferral, deferral, deferral. And it be it became a block that they could not, with the go best terrestrial up. psychological techniques in the 1970s, and I guess maybe into the 80s, Ten ever right. get around. Ed Mitchell never could remember and could never get in touch with what it felt like, Keep which left, means the block was much better than any current terrestrial mind control or psychoactive drug technology that's available to the intelligence agencies, not just of the US, but of any nation on the planet, which makes me wonder what was applied to these astronauts to where they could not remember what is really there, if they had simply looked. What's an excellent? It's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. Um, Which I, means I, it's all these stories of abductions and gray aliens and body part examinations and all that. They all could be synthetic force memories, conditioned, programmed to basically build a wall between human beings and what's really out there or who is really out there. In other words, to keep us 
separated as prisoners here on, uh, you know, the prison planet Earth, to kind of misquote uh, Alex Jones. You guys do know that the Navy filed a patent for an electric propulsion system that lets you do all the things you guys just discussed about flying at thousands of miles an hour, not only through the air, but under the water, and make 90 degree right angle turns at full speed because it negates inertia, right? I'm familiar with, with the fact this was stated. I don't know the details. Yeah, right. and in fact, I, I know the, I, yeah, you're talking about Salvatore Pace patents, right? Right, and we've yeah. got Bob Lazar with the Element 115, the well, A-wave, B-wave phase. Oh, I think the Element 15 is all all disinformation. That's that's not how yeah, that's, the physics and anti-gravity really work. Anyway, Tim, pick up on this Navy patent, because this has been something I've wanted to have time to look at, never had the time. Keith bringing it up tonight is the perfect time. So what is it? How is it supposed to work? And has the Navy produced any vehicles? Um, so with the Salvador Pace patents, and I believe he's calling it the Pace effect, he had a, he had many different patents that he filed. Um, he made a lot of claims. Uh, some of those claims haven't been substantiated, so it's difficult to tell. Um, when I, you, know, when I, you say, sorry to interrupt, when you say Pace, do you mean a guy by the name of Pace, Pace P-A-C-E? Uh, no, P-A-I-S. Ah, Salvatore okay. Pace, yeah. Um, yeah, and he has been filing these patents. And, and, and who is Salvador Pace? He, well, he, 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 works for, he works for the Navy. He's one of their researchers. Um, it looks like he's been doing these kind of with the blessing of his command. They, they kind of let him do it for quite a while. Is now, he a I, civilian I, contractor or a Navy personnel? I believe he's Navy personnel, and they actually did. Um, they they did get some funding. They built a couple of demos. If, if you go online, you have to dig a little bit, but you can Google it. Is this at um, the Naval Research Laboratory south of Washington? I believe so, but I'm a little fuzzy on it. Um, but the, the long and the short of it is, um, you know, I mean, he maintains that all of this kind of came from his own head. Um, it, it seems like, I mean, the, the impression that I get is that he basically he had a really nice commanding officer who just kind of let him let him file the patents. That's the story, at least. And um, I know recently, b because I've talked to him, and he said um, that they, they've clamped down, you know, and I would assume it's because of this UAP thing, right? If, but his story was that, you know, he, he has a new commanding officer, and um, they've decided that they're they're creating a little bit too much noise, getting too much publicity with these patents. And so they, they've kind of asked him to keep a low profile for a while. So uh, you can kind of take keep that right, for what's And worth. then exit right. Um, simply because he's in the Navy and filing patents, I, I don't necessarily consider them any more valid than anyone right. else's. Well, the obvious question is, has anybody built hardware? Well, again, they did one test. They, they, you know, they did build some hardware. They, when you they say they, you mean, the, you mean the U.S. Navy? Yeah, well, yeah, his, his team, they built a test to, to, you know, and if you Google it, they've got, they've got their experiment up there. And I, I, they have what they thought was maybe a potential result, but, um, From what I understand the patent office was going to deny it until one of his superior officers went in and said, grant the patent, we have a working prototype. Is that uh, just a law, a figment, or didn't really occur? That, yeah, I mean, I've never heard that, but it, it's it's possible, but I've never heard that. Do we have a link, Keith, to anything that's real, that's tangible, like, like the patent itself? Because we need to put that up, if we do, probably in uh, Tim's section tonight. Can see it? pay attention Keith will send you the link if he's got it do you yes there's a whole bunch of them out okay then, so then give that to yeah you. um I, I mean I guess my my takeaway on it has been and you know and I, I've looked into this a lot but you know it's been a while um uh you know from from talking with the guy and from everything I've kind of researched there it seems like he's he's an innovator right he, he's trying to he's trying to come up with new ideas seems like his heart is in the right Goes place straight on. um it doesn't seem particularly nefarious from what i can from everything i can tell he's not really getting results it's just he's kind of coming up with these ideas and saying based on what i know this should produce this effect okay well that's do you, you know, know enough this. about this either one of you uh to describe how it might work 
what the, what the theoretical foundation for control of gravity is in, in this patent? Uh, yes, no. he's, he's using microwaves. So it's like yeah, the so it's like the M drive in in a way. Uh, according to what the diagrams show, somehow they're using sending the microwaves down an outer uh, channel around the outside of the craft, not outside, but between the inner inner core of the craft and the outer wall, of the craft. and somehow this creates uh, the system. Uh, I haven't got all the details because the patent doesn't get into enough to really figure out exactly what's going on, but it, that's exactly what they're using. They're using microwave. Yeah, but isn't the reason for a patent that you publish enough detail so that someone else can duplicate the piece of technology you're claiming to have invented? How can you well, have a patent if there's not enough information to replicate what it's claiming it represents? In, in theory, but, but in practice, especially when you're talking about propulsion, the, the patent office is littered with propulsion patents that have never been built, never Keep been tested. Right. So they're, they're interesting, you know, again, the, I mean, my community collects them. We've got lots and lots of them floating around. Um, most of them have never been built or, or a prototype was built and had mixed results. So, you know, patents by themselves, um, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I know with the, with the Navy patents, it, it's one of those things where it raises a lot of eyebrows or a lot of unknowns. But personally, I, I don't consider that to, to demonstrate anything other than one you know, very active, engaged person who th you know thinks he's on to something. So now it, it's well. It's uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. The reason I give this credence <laughs> is because many years ago, I was in touch with a physicist out of China Lake which is the major naval West Coast top secret research facility located there north of Barstow in the middle of nowhere. They had a major earthquake, you know, a couple of years ago, which did all kinds of damage to the base. But they've headquartered some very unusual cutting edge research there, including the first naval efforts to duplicate cold fusion were done by the Navy, U.S. government efforts done by the U.S. Navy at China Lake, and I was in touch with one of the physicists who was involved in the research. Then cold fusion kind of fell out of favor. These things go in cycles politically. It's back. The Navy is doing new experiments, published experiments in cold fusion. So that would be the place I would look China Lake to Keep see left, if someone is trying to reproduce left. in hardware the PACE equations and patents. Yeah, yeah. Turn and left. again, to the, to the best of my knowledge, that, that is all on hold right now. So, the, I, I know that they did one experiment. I saw that documented. You know, and, and again, you can Google that. But with a little bit of work, you'll be able to find it. It produced very mixed, mixed results. Maybe it did something that it didn't. On. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, everything is on hold there. Right. And, and, and I, would, I would assume this UAP issue is probably why. You know, from a from a political perspective, it makes sense, right? You, I mean, they they're they have a lot of people looking at them right now, and so anywhere in a command position is going to try and keep a low profile until things blow over, which is pretty normal for government agencies. Yeah. See, again, I want to think big picture. I want to go up to thirty, ah, hell, fifty thousand feet. I have been aware of certain inventors. Keith, you'll remember, you know, Troy Reed. Remember the discussion about Troy Reed building his, his free energy device, which was like a huge um, <clears throat> uh, paddle wheel on an old paddle wheel steamer, which had magnets arranged in a certain geometric configuration. The, the once, Reed magnetic motor. That yeah, once, I... you, once you rotated the wooden wheel, the magnets would <clears throat> repel and attract in a way that it would go faster and faster and faster and it would produce a net positive energy. That's what, that's what Reed, Reed claimed. Well, his additional claim was that he got the idea from a set of dreams that came to him from an unknown source. So here's my far out speculation. 
If in fact the human race has been artificially kept down on the farm, that's the reason why UFO research has been ridiculed for decades and decades and decades, because the secret on. of our liberation is the anti-gravity slash free energy equation to where we liberate ourselves from fossil fuels, uh, <clears throat> resource limitations of mining stuff, as opposed to making it literally out of the ether, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Suppose there is someone out there who's able to insinuate through, shall we say, um, telepathic means, ideas in certain fertile, inventive minds to give them ideas that can then be brought through patents to the marketplace. And there's a counterforce, which is trying to keep us suppressed, to keep us down on the farm, that keeps making it look absurd and ridiculous and keep drying up all the money, and making the experiments fail. In other words, there is this invisible war which has been going on for decades, if not hundreds of years, between that force trying to liberate humanity and another force trying to keep us in Turn bondage. Left. And it's all coming to a head now. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure how to respond. I, I, I guess I would agree with the last part. It's all coming to a head now. I think. Get ready. Uh, to I, I think left. it's probably. I think it's more than fair to say whatever is going on, it's all happening now. You know, and it's interesting that it's happening after the pandemic too. Turn you know, I, I mean, it seems like the zeitgeist has kind of shifted. You know, it, it doesn't. Or at least to me, it doesn't feel like we're in the 20th century anymore feels like we're in a new century, you know? I mean, I, I think the pandemic was kind of the turning point for that. Well, it's changed so many things, like, you know, remote work, telemark, te telework. Go straight on. Uh, you know, no longer having to commute. Major corporations looking at the efficiencies from working at home if you have childcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or school. In other words, we're looking at fundamental restructuring of some of the assumptions of society because we've been through this, you know, hell on earth for the last year and a half. Into that environment, it's kind of like people are anticipating something new, maybe in this area as well. And suddenly we have the government saying UFOs are real. Hey, we are at the uh, top of the hour, so let's hold it there. My guest this morning is Tim Ventura and uh, Keith Morgan, who is our able expert in IT and other technological subjects, and a definite expert in the field of UFOs, has joined in with a very interesting contribution having to do with this Navy patent. You are on the other side of midnight. When we come back, we're going to be joined by Ron Gerbron, who I'm sure has been sitting there with bubbling ideas to add to the conversation. And uh, if you want to make a phone call or two and join us, I'll give out numbers. If you want to join the conversation, you're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return. Keep right. Keep right, and then turn right. Turn right. The other side of midnight.com. Talk radio with pictures on demand. Liberate your hyperdimensional time scale and non-linearly access over 400 hours of conversation at the cutting edge of science and thought. Go straight on. Content that fits your interests and time schedule. Filter episodes by guest or subject. Membership costs, $9.95 a month, 
33 cents a day. Listen while you travel, or as an environment to your endeavors. 8 cents an Keep episode, and then 2 and a half right. cents per hour of content. The other side of midnight.com. Turn right. Welcome back, everyone, on this Sunday night. Now, actually, Monday morning. It is uh, July 12th, 2021. And yesterday, July 11th, 7-11, uh, Richard Branson broke the um, democratization barrier by being the first leader to take a band of civilians to the edge of space in the uh, Virgin Galactic uh, spacecraft, Unity 22, hanging under a mothership named Eve after his uh, departed mother. She died of uh, COVID-19 back in January. It's a shame that she's no longer with us because she would have been tickled pink to see what her son had done. And the revolution that he is initiating, imagine, imagine his childhood. Imagine the kind of mother she must have been to inculcate such an open, endless questing spirit where he has conquered so many Keep frontiers. Right, and you then know, turn uh, right. Tim, I'm just wondering, at what point are the leading uh, you know, explorers, the pioneers right. in this civilian space revolution, when are they going to bump into the concept left, of the control of gravity left. and with their literal billion it takes money, Turn you know, left. the old phrase, no bucks, no buck rogers. They're literal billions. They make the transition from rockets to the basis Go straight of up. a real space program. Well, and I think that brings up the topic of the, the APEC conference. I and, was just going to go I've there. Been, You're reading my mind. Yeah, I, I've been moderating that. So... I guess to, to take a long story short, um, there was a there was a, a conference called the Estes Park Conference, and there was a confluence of events. I guess that kind of made this happen. But uh, James Woodward, right, and some of the Mox principal folks, they have this. Wait, 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 wait. Park. You're hang on, you're mentioning a whole bunch of names. First of all, Estes Park is a suburb of Denver in Colorado. So for people that don't follow all this, please identify the places, the conference, the participants, why we should care what they're doing. In other words, assume we know nothing, which in some areas I yeah. Well, so James Woodward has been working, uh, you know, he, he works at the University And James Woodward is who? Southern. Who is James Woodward? Well, he's James Woodward. He's a, he, he is a, a PhD, you know, physicist who's been working on reactionless drives based on Mox principle for several years, many years, um, yeah, I mean, 30, 40 something years. And they've been getting little results here and there, you know, trying to get above the noise, so to speak. So they had a big annual conference at Estes Park that they did every year. And COVID put that on hold. So rather than, rather than call the conference off, they decided, this is I, I think in August of 2020, something around there, they decided they were going to host this via Zoom. And so, you know, a, a friend of mine, Mark Sokol, went to this conference on Zoom. And in the discussion sessions, he wanted to talk about some of the garage experiment work that was being done. And he wanted to talk about some experiments that they didn't have on their on their docket, on their schedule. And they said, well, you know, look, we planned this thing out months ahead. We're trying to make do with what we have. So, you know, we, we, we just, we don't have the time or the space. So what he realized at the time was he said, well, wait a minute, we've got a bunch of people who never talk to each other, right? Because there, there really aren't any good emerging propulsion conferences out there. Estes Park was small. It, it, was, it was just a few folks. He said, we have the opportunity here to leverage Zoom and do a large conference. 
so a few months went by and he approached me in October and we started the Alt Propulsion Conference, the Alternative Propulsion Engineering Conference. And uh, I mean, you can visit online. The website is altpropulsion.com, and it's, it's just www.altpropulsion.com. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's your item number one in Radio with Pictures tonight. Yeah, so um, they asked me to moderate it, and I said, okay. You know, I, I haven't actively been doing work in this area in quite a while. You know, I stay up on it, but I, I'm not really doing anything anymore. But if you want me to moderate it, you know, be, I mean, just because people are familiar with me in that community, sure thing. So. So we started doing this twice a month on Saturday afternoon. When did you begin? And this? I was really, uh, I think our first one was November 5th, if I remember right. Of last year. So, yeah, just about six okay. months. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so we started doing these conferences regularly, and um, the community really came together. You know, we, we've had, I would say, probably 90% big names in the community and we're working on getting the other 10% in there um, you know we have not had Salvador Pace the Navy patents we, we did have someone discuss them it wasn't him um, can you put, give, give me just a sec sure no problem and while you're doing that let me ask a question on the air is uh, Keith is Ron with us yet you can open your mic okay sorry about that no sorry about that oh yeah I'm, yeah I'm here excellent okay when 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 uh, Tim is done doing this part, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. So stand by. Go ahead. Tim. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, so yeah, we, we started doing this off propulsion conference, and we've had folks like Roger Scheuer, EM Drive, presented. Um, we've had many many physicists, many many engineers, and what we try and do is mix things up. So typically, we'll do two or three presentations per per conference, right? And, and that, that ranges from you know, physicists talking about theoretical propulsion ideas to people with engineering ideas, uh, people with community history. For instance, we had a fellow named Sandy Kidd do a presentation yesterday. Oh, he's 84 years old. God, he's a, he's a veteran, yeah. an incredible pioneer in this field. He's, he's, he's like yeah. Lathwaite. He's been doing rotational uh, gyroscopic stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, he presented yesterday. Um, along with a fellow from the University of London named Remy Cornwall, who was, was talking about a completely different collection of stuff. So we have presentations, and then typically after that, then we have kind of a lab day and open discussion section. And again, Mark Sokol and, and his group of colleagues, they are literally working in garages. They're building their own labs, and they're trying different experiments. And what they're doing is they're just going through this collection of experiments that we've all heard and read about, and they're trying to build each one as they go, you know? And I, I would say, for the time being, we're seeing lots of failures, but we're also seeing <laughs> lots of interesting stuff. So, you know, it, it, I, I mean, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna try and pretend that it is something that it isn't, you know? Um, you know, but it, it's a lot, I would say it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to bring the community together. And I think one of the goals for me is it helps to document this community's history, which I think is incredibly important. You know, a lot of the folks in this community are, are older, and we're, we're losing we're losing that community's culture. And then we've also, I think, had Keep some right. tragedies. And then um, turn right. Mark McCandlish presented on the ARV. He presented, I think, last, I believe it was last December. And, and unfortunately, turn he right. passed earlier this year. So, you know, one of our goals is to try and capture this information. We put the entire thing out there on YouTube, and, and the hope is, you know, that people will just watch that over time. Maybe they can use that in their own experiments. So, so See, that's, that's kind of where things are with that. To me, this is so emblematic of a story that uh, John Campbell, <clears throat> who was the editor and founder of Astounding Science Fiction, that turned into Analog Magazine, for which I wrote for many years all kinds of science, uh, uh, cutting edge science stuff. John Campbell published a story in the 1950s, and I forget who wrote the story, but it's very appropriate for the conversation tonight because the story involved a private inventor who was trying to develop an anti-gravity technology that could be worn um, on the back 
like a backpack, like uh, the uh, Bell Labs rocket belt, except it wasn't a rocket, it was true anti-gravity. And the story opens where uh, the inventor has been killed by the destruction uh, of himself and the device in one of his test flights, but fortunately the test flight was filmed. Remember back in the 50s we had film, 35 millimeter, 60 millimeter, no video. And the story revolves around this this Hitler. laboratory, which which this uh, government guy has come to with these films and basically said, if you can duplicate this in individual inventor who's no longer with us for search, we will award you a huge fat government contract because obviously based on these films, he developed anti-gravity it died with him. You've got to retrace what he did and figure out how he did it and do it for us. So the bulk of the story is how they work through this and that problem and this situation and that funding and that you know propulsion, nonlinear problem materials and all that. And ultimately, they produce a device which is about the size of a uh, uh, bed spring of an old-fashioned mattress, you know, with coils and all that, and it's hovering above the floor Keep by left. six inches, and it's humming fiercely, and it's not something you can strap on your back, but it is hovering, and it is anti-gravity, and the punchline of the story, and I wish I could remember who wrote this, it might have been Arthur, right, was that the, the films and the inventor and the explosion and the destruction of all the data was all made up. It was all fiction by this government agency that figured the only way to get a breakthrough in anti-gravity was to demonstrate to a bunch of geniuses that somebody had done it and then had been destroyed and all this group of geniuses had to do was recapitulate what they had done because the barrier that it was possible to do had been broken by this carefully contrived film record of the mythical individual inventor and his destruction with his own backpack machine. The reason I tell that story is because once these hearings are underway, and once you have bona fide official government representatives attesting to the reality of anti-gravity spacecraft or aircraft or technology, the money will pour in. These lab inventors will get contracts and we will be on the verge of a stunning breakthrough because the biggest problem has been the non-reality of the entire field, which is what the DNI report has now broken. Thoughts? Yeah, well, not just gravity modification, but I, I think one of the other things that comes out of UAPs is this idea that on some or many of these videos, there's there's one called the Puerto Rico UAP video that was taken by, a, it was a U.S. government, I, I believe it was a drug interdiction plane, but, um, and there was footage there that, that makes it look very much like there's gravitational lensing happening. So oh my, I, you I mean like tractor beams and compressor beams? Well, I, I, I'm actually I'm thinking more like warp drive. So, oh. so it, it and and that could explain a lot. That could explain a heck of a lot, right? Like, so these navy videos, you've got some blurriness, you've got some weird effects. You know, I mean, they these these I believe are not high resolution originals. I, I it, as I understand things, the originals are a lot higher res. They've been but, deliberately dumbed um, down. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. That uh, we can travel amongst the stars. He said that we there was a flaw in the mathematics, but they figured it out. He said we could take ET home tomorrow. He said if you've seen it on Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, found it wasn't practical. That's the we famous got, quote from Ben Rich at the Skunk Works in Lockheed Martin many years right. ago. And he said these things are locked up in such black projects that it would take an act of God to get them released. Then Rumsfeld comes forward in 2001 and says, oh. $2.6 trillion are missing from the military budget, and we don't know where it went. <laughs> and then everybody got distracted by 9-11. The day September. after 9-11 occurs. Yeah. 
and then nobody went back to that. With that kind of money, you could build a base on the moon, base on Mars, and get the craft, build the craft to take us between all three planets. So what's really going on? Somebody's got two technologies going on, a highly advanced one, and the one that we keep riding into space on flames with. We've been burning stuff since caveman days. It's time to get into the real electromagnetic spectrum and energy generation that this universe works on. Because we don't live in a nuclear universe, we live in an electromagnetic universe. And that's what they're going to discover. So we are ignoring the fact that Ben Rich said that. We're ignoring that Jesse Marcel Sr. told us, hey, it was a craft that crashed. We are ignoring all the things that have been going on because people don't want to believe. But now we're at the point where they got to wake up and come into the 21st century because we may be in the 21st century, but they're still thinking with 13th century mentality. Okay, which is a well, perfect I, segue. I, I think, go, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, and I think it would be, and if this goes to hearings, hopefully, you know, it would be nice to, to have someone stand up and say, what, what did Ben Rich mean? he said that you know I, I i mean i think i think that somebody should stand up and say what well, you know what did he i mean yeah I, i've heard that quote as well and it raises more questions i mean it doesn't offer any answers it raises lots of questions you know if we have the technology to take et home was was that ben rich was that him like bsing was he trying to pretend like he had something he didn't have or or do we truly have that technology and, and if so is that mixed up with this UAP stuff, or is that something else, well, right? Well, so. I keep bringing up the model during the Watergate hearings, the infamous Watergate hearings, which changed how we, the American people, voters, viewed the presidency and led to Nixon's resignation before his impeachment. And those hearings, when Sam Irvine conducted those hearings, there was a guy that no one had ever heard of named Alexander Butterfield. And in open hearings, he blurted out that the Nixon had a uh, taping system in the Oval Office. That changed history. If we get these hearings, and I think it's, uh, you know, odds on dollars to Navy beans, we're going to get hearings. And they'll be televised. They'll be live. They might even be in prime time because of the intense public interest. Hell, the U.S. government is saying UFOs are real. How could they not put them on in prime time. Look at all the mainstream stories up to and including detailed stories in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the networks, etc., etc., etc. So, if you have hearings, all it takes is one guy. And we now know from our legal side that whatever is said in the hearings is apart from the NDAs these guys have all signed. They cannot be sued they cannot be brought up on charges for admitting classified stuff in a formal uh, congressional hearing, period. So it's going to be again, Katie, bar the door. This is the entree to all kinds of revelations, and it will not be controlled. It will not be controllable, which is why I think we're on the verge of a stunning acceleration in human technological development, which is the great segue to Ron Gerbron, who is our resident generalist. Ron, you've been listening. What are your thoughts? Well, I've got a uh, huge bubbling list here. <laughs> uh, no, I actually only a couple things. I Just let me get uh, toss something in because it's, it's what you were talking about earlier, but when you were talking about patents, uh, it is not unusual to uh, have intentional flaws in a patent so that people can't simply get the patent, which is freely available to anybody unless it's, you know, it's sequestered somewhere, uh, and copy the, the thing, whatever it, whatever it may be. And so there'll be mistakes, uh, intentional, careful mistakes in technical diagrams, things like that. And it doesn't invalidate the, the patent. You know, it's just like, on there, and it's all you get. I mean, and that goes way back. Uh, Charles Babbage, that uh, developed the uh, forerunner to the modern computer idea, uh, had these beautiful 
uh, engineering diagrams that uh, circulated around showing exactly all the gears and wheels and steampunk coolness <laughs> that uh, com- comprised the device. And there were mistakes in there. When the London Museum was trying to do a modern replica of his uh, one of his machines, he didn't get to build all of them because he talked to the British government out of a huge amount of money for development on these. Uh, the uh, they went ahead and built one, and they discovered these. You know, bright engineers looking at it said, "Well, no, this goes over here." So they fixed them, and they got the thing to work, and it works fine. Uh, within whatever it does. Anyway, that so that can that could apply to a lot of these patent stories. You know, you get the patent because I've done that. You know, you get the patent to something and you figure, oh, I can build one now. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> so you never know. But uh, on this other stuff, um, I there's a well, I'll get to the big question in a second. But I got two I got two UFO observations of uh, my own that I think are relevant. One night there was this rumbling outside and I went outside to look because it was completely overcast even though there was a full moon. You mean and, down near uh, San Diego where you live? Yes, yes, right. Northern San Diego County and I'm in a quiet zone where they uh there's very little air traffic and it's the way that a, you know, a a, a plane like Air Force 1 would fly in along there. You know, it's part of their route to stay out of the normal traffic lanes. And uh, so I get a lot of military traffic from Miramar, which is not far away. Anyway, I hear this rumbling. So I went outside to see what it was. I walked across the street, and I looked up, and there was a big hole in the clouds. And that's the rumbling was coming from up there. Uh, it sounded like thunder. And, uh, but, you know, no rain or anything. And this triangular craft rather slowly came overhead. Now, the clouds would be at about, uh, what, uh, a little under 2,000 feet, and that's the only thing I had to go by in this local terrain. And the, uh, it was brightly lit behind the clouds because of that. And this thing came skimming over the clouds, and I could, it had colored light panels on the bottom, which were reflecting off the top of the cloud layer. It was, just, it was literally skimming it, so mm. there was no question about it. Uh, I mean, as clear a look as you could get. Now, of course, I didn't have a camera. Um, well, this was back about six weeks before the first Gulf War. So oh, in 91. So, yeah, so nobody had, uh, you know, it happened to be back then. So uh, anyway, uh, so I burned it into my brain as best I could. It was a slightly not quite there isosceles triangle shape. And it had the entire bottom surface was covered with these little neurons that looked exactly like... Uh, a little tiny shower head or a sprinkler, you know, rain bird or something. They looked exactly like sprayers of some sort or the nozzles uh, over your seat on an airplane that you adjust for the, you know, something along those lines. But there were rows and rows of them, like all across the exposed surface of the underside of this thing, which was a typical sort of stealth gray color, uh, the body of it. But the light panels were long rectangles like you would see in a fluorescent ceiling. And the light in them was backwards, like right down the long uh, axis of these was a blinding bright light, just a bar of it. And the color got darker as you went out toward the edges. And they weren't even normal colors. One of them was pink. Uh, one was a kind of a turquoise blue. Uh, one was a fairly ordinary green color. Uh, and um, the, uh, there were like five of them. And they were not distributed evenly across the bottom. And in the middle of this whole assemblage of strangeness up there uh, was what were very clearly what bomb bay doors. You know, just just big old just big old bomb bay doors that would open up and drop something out. So this thing wasn't making any noise except for that rumbling sound, which was reverberating everywhere. And it gave me the impression there were a Keep bunch right. of these. And then the exit clouds, right. And I just happened to see one go straight overhead. Now I don't know what that was, but I believe it was built here. Exit. Just right. because of the, yeah, it sounds like here. How yeah, big? How how, right. how big? How big was the And then turn right. Okay, well I'll put all the mathematicians to work. I said the cloud turn cover right. was, and I did check that as best I could, about 2,000 feet or a little less. So that's uh, you know, and they weren't, I, however thick they were, the cloud, the ship was right above them. And I stretched my arms straight up from Keep my shoulders. Right. 
and then like, turn uh, right. Whatever that sports thing is, what the umpires do, where they stick their arms up in the air. Oh, you mean um, the you, you mean the ref in the end right. zone, holds his arms that up. That thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I did it. I did, uh, visually exactly like that without the striped shirt. Turn right. And um, <laughs> I it was that was how that was how big it was from uh, tip to tip. You have arrived. Well, that's like I said, it was a little bit longer Your than it was wide. But is now so. finished. That's like 20, 30 degrees. Yeah, but yeah, and I mean that, at that two thousand feet. You no, know, remember one radian is fifty-seven degrees. So if it was if it was fifty-seven degrees wide, at two thousand feet, it would be two thousand feet long. So it's two. It would. It was like it was like an aircraft carrier. It was a thousand feet, or more. That that seems reasonable. Yeah. Floating, silently, except for the rumbling which may have been a low subharmonic of the drive system. Yeah, because it was not, it did not feel like or sound, nor sound like it was coming from it, you know, it, but it was following it. You know, it was like it was a null or a node in the middle of this noise. Oh. Because the noise was, so that's, well, uh, yes, Tim? I, you know, yeah, yeah. actually, if I, if I could jump in, um, what Please. you're describing sound what you're describing sounds like um, what's what's called the stealth blimp. Have you read about that at all? I have, and I don't think that's what this was. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, I because actually this was my believe it or not this was my UFO experience, which which I've compartmentalized pretty well because I've never figured it out. But um, yeah, I mean, in in my case, I, I had it was yeah like you described. It was kind of a flat gray. Um, black triangle. It was big. It flew over. It, it flew right over my house. I think this would have been '96. Um, and it had. And the thing that got me about it was it, when it flew over my house. I, I mean, it was low enough to the ground. It, when you were looking at the middle of it, you couldn't see the edges of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, it almost looked a little bit like a B2, except you know the B2 is is a wing shape. This thing was a triangle, you know, and it was enormous. I mean, this thing would probably a couple of b2s in in wingspan um sure and the thing that got me about it was the underside of the hull had double row rivets it had hull plates with rivets and it had like bombay doors like you're talking so about. it was like steampunk yeah are you sure they were rivets i because i could see little nozzles i really i think i had an uncannily clear look at it because of the conditions you know the air was clear except for those clouds and the and the, there was a full moon behind them so it, it there was lots of illumination but it's are you mm, sure they were yeah. rivets it, 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 lo it looked like That's rivets good. to me it looked like overlapping hull plates with dual road rivets and and i i did the same thing i i tried to burn it into my memory right when you don't have a camera you just kind of look up and just um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I heard the low rumbling. It was a subaudible rumbling in, in my case. It was you, you kind of had to like listen for it. Right. It was like. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, and and so, uh, yeah, I mean, this thing flew right overhead, though, and flew right out over the bay and banked. And uh, and so the, the thing that got me about it was. Hey, guys, um, hold it there. We're at the bottom of the hour. We'll pick this up ooh. exactly where Tim leaves it. You're on the other side of midnight. My guests this morning are Ron Gerbron, our resident generalist, who knows something about almost everything. And Tim Ventura, founder and head of American Anti-Gravity, and a recent series of Zoom global conferences on anti-gravity and the state of the art. Turn right. The experimenters, the theoreticians, just add money. Get ready to turn right. Who knows right. what will come out of the woodwork. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. Turn right. Get ready to turn left. The other side of midnight.com. Turn left. Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hoagland and his fascinating guest. Go straight on. Support the broadcast and don't miss another groundbreaking conversation. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen.
listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. Drive safe. And welcome back, everyone. Last half hour, Sunday night, Monday morning, July 11th, 12th, here in the Land of Enchantment. My guests this morning are Tim Ventura. Turn right. And Ron Gerbron. And Keith Morgan has been chiming in with some very interesting tidbits on uh, current patents, technology, UFO developments. So, gentlemen, uh, let's continue. Tim, you were in the middle of a story. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and again, I'm not describing it in detail, but but yeah, like Ron had said, I, I saw a black triangle flew right over me. I mean, it was um, it was following the curve of a hill that I lived on. I was living in Bellingham, Washington at the time. Um, it was, I don't know, probably around seven o'clock at night. And so I would imagine, I would think probably lots of people saw it. But maybe not, you know, it was, it was kind of, I don't know, people were kind of winding down for the evening. I'm not sure how many folks were outside. Um, and, you know, it, ma it makes you wonder. The, the thing that got me about it, though, that was interesting was, I, again, I, I saw this. I asked a few friends. I actually called the airport and the police station to see if they'd had any sightings, right? I was like, well, this is just the darndest thing. And, um, you know, and, of course, they didn't have anything. The airport was actually closed. You know, it's a, it's a smaller airport. And so um, basically I kind of came away empty handed and I just kind of filed it away in my brain and said, OK, well, this happened. I don't know what the heck to make of it. And uh, so that was in 96. And later in 2001, 2002, I think, you know, when the Internet was kind of picking up steam, um, I stumbled across something called the Stealth Blimp. And they had a list of sightings, and most of them were over the Great Lakes region. And the, the, the craft that the people described was almost identical to what I saw, you know. And it was massive. It, the, and and some okay. people were speculating we that this was a rigid hull dirigible, right? So um, so if you can imagine a giant metal hulled helium. Well, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm having a leap of um, intuition here. Was it called the stealth blimp because to most people, 99.9999%, anything big that hovers silently has got to be a blimp because they don't know from anti-gravity from Grandma Moses. So it got the name a stealth blimp, but in fact, it's not a blimp. It, it I'd, could be, I'd vote with it Richard on that one, yeah. I mean, to me, honestly, if, if you were going to pick, like, what is the closest, what is the closest thing it looked like? I would say it looked like a small star destroyer from Star Wars. Ah! And I know that sounds, <laughs> no, I know it that sounds, sounds perfect. odd. No, it sounds no, that perfect. Is perfect. That's, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, so, you, you know, and, and I, I don't know, it makes you wonder. I mean, the thing that I saw, uh, the thing that jumped out at me, and again, the, you know, I, I it's, for me, it's difficult to call it a UFO because what kind of a UFO has rivets? That, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's well, a obviously, what? obviously a steampunk UFO. Yeah, I've got a worse one. If you if you have something built out of composite res resins, uh, how often do you staple it or staple or rivet it together? Let's do this. You know, that's why that's that for me is the is the fatal flaw for that because I mean you. Plating, you know, is required for rivets, and they work better if they're more or less lined up. <laughs> uh, but it's, there was an awful lot of it. Uh, yeah, no, realistically, by materials, you wouldn't make it out of uh, you wouldn't make it out of um, hull steel uh, because 
you know, no gas is going to lift that. So that's why I said I, I line up with Richard on this. But I, I, I just want to say two things Get quickly. Ready the, uh, turn left. Uh, you see a lot of reports about triangular UFOs, and almost always they're completely symmetrical. Turn you know, they've got left. like three lights on the bottom, and they're right at the points and so forth. And this Fine. is just so out of kilter from that that obviously it was in, it looked like a kludge. You know, it was intentional engineering to get something done. Are any of you so, familiar, either you guys or maybe Keith too, with uh, Paul LaViolette's stunning classic work on anti-gravity propulsion technologies, which came out several years ago? And he documents from secret sources and memoranda going all the way back before T. Townsend Brown a dedicated deep black anti-gravity research and development effort which resulted in a lot of hardware and a lot of deep black projects that never have been acknowledged by you know the mainstream military community but in fact we know are a huge reservoir of engineering and flight experiments and developed technology on which one could build an entire secret Ready terrestrial work. or u.s space program working with anti-gravity, which of course uh, was, was part of the disclaimer in the DNI report that they kind of, you know, cast around. And it's not ours because none of the guys said, you know, it's ours, which of course I thought was another silly statement because if it is really deep black, why are they going to admit to a Senate committee until they're forced to, you know, right. pull kicking and screaming to sit in the witness chair under pain of, you know, congressional sanction that any of our own deep black, incredibly advanced anti-gravity technologies uh, actually exist. Yeah, I, I, you know, and then I, maybe another possibility is maybe maybe this is fake. You were talking about the Brookings report and, and movies and stuff to expose people to, you know, this growing truth of, of ET, I guess. Right. What so, the so what what if it's a fake to to run up ufo reports right what fake i, I, I don't what's a fake what's a fake I don't oh well i i, I mean what, what i was i mean again the this this you know what if they what if they were basically faking some kind of a ufo to generate Turn ufo left. reports you know what i mean do you sort of want, the dark you, side of richard of the story that richard told me. Yeah. you want to hear a really bizarre yeah. thing that came out this morning out of Branson's own mouth, which I did not know. He was asked by some reporter, I think Reuters, Go straight on. at the press conference after the successful flight, if he carried any personal mementos to the edge of space and back. And he opened up one of the pockets in the uh, uh, Under Keep Armour right. uh, suits they were right. all wearing, and he pulls out a sheaf of pictures, turn and he right. starts going through them one by one family pictures, grandchildren, some mementos from friends of his, etc. Then he pulls out one picture and he says, this is my uh, uh, kids standing in front of the fake Go UFO that we flew over London in the 1980s and scared everybody to death. And he goes into the details. In other words, in his own historic breaking the sound barrier paradigm shift of commercial civilian space travel, he deliberately flaunts a photo of a fake UFO he created and the public outcry among the London police and Scotland Yard and a Bobby that ran like hell when their fake ET emerged from the balloon UFO in Hyde Park and started toward the Bobby who had said before it landed, I'll take care of this, and then he ran away at warp nine. And in the middle of this press conference, Keep uh, right. you know, Branson is telling this UFO story about his own activities in faking a UFO. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I mean, pretty potentially. Funny. Yeah. It, it, it's I don't. There's some strangeness. I, I'm looking forward to you hearing think? this. You think? I think that we'll. I think that we'll have them. It's, it, it, I mean, you know, but, but again, I, I think the part, at least for me, I think the part that's been the biggest um, disconnect for me this year is just this thought that, okay, UFOs are real, right? And it's not, it, you know, it's it's not just me that's saying it. This is, you know, the federal government, right?
learning and so that's there i think there's going to be an emotional acceptance process and and we're probably all going to have to kind of work towards that it'll take a while but you know a lot of doors will open as a result okay we only got a few minutes left here it's about uh we got about 20 minutes okay i want to direct everybody back to my section of radio with pictures i want to direct you to item numbers seven and eight and we'll get to six in a moment seven is a close-up of the largest satellite of jupiter in fact the largest satellite in the solar system called ganymede and it was taken by a recent flyby of the juno nasa mission which has a very good camera and what nasa does is they take these pictures it's a rotating spacecraft so the pictures are kind of like mind scanned like an old-fashioned fax machine and computers now can undo the the rotation and the scanning and the geometry and they put these amazing images together they then put them on their website which is item number eight on on my section of radio with pictures and then average citizens who know how to manipulate software and photoshop etc cetera, etc cetera, they take these images these official images and they produce their own uh, civilian products from these official NASA Jovian and Jovian satellite images. Well, anyway, if you take a look at number seven, click on it. From several different processors of the same NASA Ganymedian data, there is this stunning confirmation that covering the entire globular surface of the satellite Ganymede which is 3,000 plus miles in diameter. It's a moon of Jupiter bigger than the planet Mercury. There is this ancient, incredibly visible, glass shattered dome like structure covering the entire moon and obviously in very bad condition because it's been millions of years since somebody built it a long, long time ago in a uh, planetary system far, far away. My point is this. If you look at that image, just that one image, and uh, we probably should post the entire disk image so you can look at the limb all the way around. I've sent this to Ron. I've sent it to several other members of our team. There's no doubt there's an enormous, gargantuan, totally impossible for any conventional terrestrial technology structure, a mega, mega, mega structure globing in an entire moon of the largest planet of the solar system millions of years ago. Obviously built by someone, some real physical beings with a technological, you know, advance that makes us look like we're still in the caves. I have been looking at this kind of extraterrestrial architecture since I started looking back in the 1980s at the face on Mars. So for me, when you have architecture built by some extraordinarily advanced beings, race all across the solar system, which shows up on NASA data, Chinese data, Russian data, Japanese data, Indian data, Israeli data, it says to me, well, if there's architecture, there have to be architects. So the idea that UFOs are real up. and they're being flown by someone not from here, and at least a percentage of them are flown by extraterrestrials from a very long distance away. I mean, I don't have to go from belief to experience because I've been living with the experience of real verifiable ruins built by somebody for decades. So, to me, the whole extraterrestrial archaeological study that Enterprise has been spearheading for decades is the way to separate the facts of the UFO community from the fiction because the only people from out there reporting to how arrived here in some disclosure scenario where they announce, we're here, will be the folks that tell us the reality of all the stuff our own space programs have verified are all around us in the ancient, incredibly inhabited 
and sophisticated, now long gone, solar system. Thoughts? Uh, well, I think that's a topic for another day, to be honest. That's a, that's a big one, right? I mean... You wanted big picture. Yeah. Well, Why is it a topic for another day? The ruins are out there. The well, ruins are real. The ruins were built by somebody. And why are those somebody? In other words, I'm looking, I think, at potential ancient ancestors of humanity. If that's true, yeah, and I, who I, I, would have I, more I, I, interest in the current state of humanity than our own relatives, the family? Well, and, and that's, yeah, them. that's where I thought you were going. Is you were saying the UAPs are us, right? That's, no, no, you, I didn't you know. say UAPs. I said UFOs, which is a much bigger subject than the UAPs. The UAPs are only those 144 incidents reported to the Defense Department from 2004 to the present, right? The UFO subject is so much bigger and deeper and longer and centuries, if not millennia, in, in, in duration. That is a vast overarching reality of which the UAP phenomenon is a tiny, tiny subset. And the only reason it's gaining credence is because the most, trust, the most trusted U.S. institution yet, the military, is reporting it from a different set of sensors, multiple observers, multiple incidents, multiple time frames. That's the database they're working from, but it's a tiny fraction of the entire field Keep that's right. going to open up and then once exit right. there are areas. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and I agree with that 100%. I, right. I think that... I, I think that the, the military, the June 25th report, that UAP report, it, it confirms, it's confirmation Turn of left. something that's much larger, and it's opening a really big door. And and I, I don't I don't think I disagree with what you're saying, you know. And it, it, the, the question is just digging until we learn more, right? It's but there is this question of how long have they been with us, and it's starting to look Go like they've been on. with us the whole time. We just didn't know what they were, you know. And and then. Then there's this question of, are they part of us, right? Is this our ancestors? Is this ancient humans? I and mean, you talked about a breakaway civilization, but could this be an ancient civilization that, you know, did, did we evolve someplace else or did we evolve here and, and this technology was developed and then lost? I mean, these are, yeah, very, very big questions. They're huge, and, important, uh, fundamental questions. And the cool part, gentlemen, the cool part is it's all going to become mainstream as those hearings commence because you know that all one senator or one congressman has to do, prompted by his constituents, that we're going to lay out in future weeks how people can actually influence these committees by sending questions and demanding answers. All one senator or congressman has to do is to ask the witness, do you think some of these are extraterrestrial Beings. And he, remember, the guy or gal is under oath. They have to, under penalty of perjury, answer truthfully. And if they demur and say, well, I can only answer that in private session, bingo! It's Katie Bar the door. Uh, Richard? Yes? I think everybody Keep is... Left. Well, everybody and then is. turn okay, left. Okay, you're everybody. You're every man in this. Uh, is uh, missing an important detail of the, of the question. I remember a conversation I had a long time ago with somebody who was uh, well, military and uh, not not a political person, you know, and, but kind of a myth, I guess. Anyway, uh, we, we, were, we talked a little bit about uh, disclosure. He said, what are you looking for? I said, I want disclosure. I want everything to come out. I think it's time for humanity to move on to the next phase. And he goes, oh, we can't, he said, with all this angst in his voice. You know, we can't. Uh, people, people don't want to know that. And I said, oh, I think they do. He said, well, what would happen? And he's acting like I knew exactly what, you know, this, the Keep left secret part of it and was. And then turn left. Uh, and um, he, uh, I said, well, whatever comes Turn next left. is what's going to happen, you know. 
and uh, that you know that's that's my attitude about this. But I, there's what is you have this? Arrived at your destination. Why can't they your handle it? Is now finished. You know that, that's we that's if you're going to deal with well, the big picture, well, my you have to prejudice deal with that. It, it, exactly, and my prejudice is the real reason. And gentlemen, you can agree or disagree, and we've got ten minutes to do both. My feeling is the whole reason for the UFO cover-up is not just because of the technology, anti-gravity, free energy, you know, ditching oil, ditching coal, ditching the, you know, the, the profit margins, corporations, the, you know, charging for reality the way Buckmaster Filler thought was silly decades ago. I think the real reason for the entire cover-up is that UFOs don't represent aliens. They represent us. They represent family. They represent what Neil Armstrong said that night on, in 1969, July 20th, when he said that's one small step for man, meaning us, one giant leap for mankind, meaning all the folks out there to whom we owe our history, our genesis, our origins, our relationships, our very existence, because it's all about the family, and it's the family they're trying to get us to ignore, and they're suppressing because we dare not know, to their detriment, our own real, extraordinary, interstellar history. I don't think that's enough. Really? Well, yeah, I, uh, well because I, that's, you know, it's, it's, well, it's, it's Pat. You know, it's it's um, too it's too compact and self-contained. I think there's motivations behind this that go into a lot of other areas. This is not just about the technology, and it's not just about the fact that we have ancestors somewhere else. You know, this is I mean, obviously the driving force is the control from our overlords. You know, it goes back to Charles Fort. He figured this out a little over a hundred years ago. You know, we have to be owned by somebody. There's, yeah, there's but if our owners are members like of, if, if our owners are our cousins, you know, in other words, we're a slave race because the overlords no more have, have affected history and have bent it such that we're in this depressed, horrible state by design, not by accident, but because someone is keeping us at this level because you're right. It's about power and control. And we see microcosms of this unfolding every day in every capital of the planet. Look at Haiti. Yeah, well, I would, for the 19.5 people out there in the audience that watched uh, Jupiter Ascending, which you still <laughs> furiously resist, uh, the, I'd say we're a, feed, we're a feed source. I mean, if you have a, uh, are you going to let your cattle start developing? Um, their own tractors? No, you know this is the the a level is set and it's maintained. I think that was covered in a book called Animal Farm many decades ago. Hey, we only got a few minutes left. Yeah. Let me go to item number okay. six. All right, item number okay. six in my radio pictures items. Remember, click on the link right below the banner at the top of the guest page to take you to my items. Go to number six. NASA announced last week as part of an official press release citing two teams that they have melded together, they now have launched an official NASA program to look for alien megastructures circling other stars. Now, you can't have alien megastructures unless, boys and girls, you have aliens. So by definition... Remember, I said at the top of the show, all of this stuff is is together. It's all connected. It's not happening separately. It's all happening as part of a gestalt right now. NASA officially tonight is in the business of looking for things built by aliens. The next step, of course, is can the aliens come here? Well, of course they can. I'm, that was kind of rhetorical. Yeah, I know. Hey, guys, we got about four minutes till the end of the show. Uh, Tim, uh, you've been a tour de force. You've taken us down all kinds of interesting byways and flyways. You wanted big picture. 
where do you think big picture this is ultimately going and how soon? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's difficult to tell. It seems like this move, it, it moves forward. It kind of lurches forward every, you know, few weeks, a few months. Um, uh, hearings make a lot of sense. I, I think that this has created a lot more questions than it has answers. Um, I, I mean, again, you've got Representative Carson. I believe it was Andre Carson mm -hmm. who is already calling for hearings, you know. So I think that we're going to see it move that direction. Um, I, I think that we're going to learn a lot more about ourselves and our history. No, no matter what the – no matter what comes out of this, I think that we're going to learn a lot more about ourselves and our history, you know. So uh, I, I think that's kind of where it's going next. After that, I don't know. I can't make any predictions. Um, my, my gut feeling with the Tic Tacs, and this is just kind of – I go back and forth on things. But I tend to think these are von Neumann probes. I, I, I tend to think that they're robotic. I don't think that there's anything inside of them. Um, you know, uh, that, that's just kind of my gut feeling. But I, I could be completely mistaken. But that that doesn't mean that there aren't other things out there with ET. I mean, so wait, wait, wait. If, the, if, 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 if they're von Neumann probes, meaning they're robotic drones from somewhere way far away, why are they tooling around U.S. military battle fleets? Well, it, it's a good question. I, I mean, I, the reason that I tend to think that is, is space travel is you know, dangerous and boring. And even if you're really good at it, at the very least, it's boring. Right. So it makes a lot of sense to have a robot kind of do a lot of this stuff. And well, well why is it boring? Uh, if, this... if, if, if warp drive is, you know, theoretically possible and you said yourself that there are weird field effects around some of these Navy videos, then why is it boring if you can get, you know, to Alpha Centauri in time for lunch? Well, it's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, I, I would say that if you're exploring system after system after system and all you're seeing is, you know, rocks, and dirt and deserts and stuff like that, um, you know, they would probably, again, the idea with the von Neumann probe is to automate a lot of that and then just focus on planets where you find but stuff. See, right? The, all right, all right. So, you, you've just opened up a whole new can of worms. We need another hour to, to tackle this. But you just laid out the standard model, which is that we're being explored for the first time by aliens who are intrigued with our primitiveness, our planet, our planetary system, our culture, whatever, whatever, whatever. My model is it's family. It's part of the control mechanism to keep us down on the farm and do with real aliens because we're part of a family history which is so weird and so warped and so shattered by seconds. the war that in fact it's it's not aliens at all it's us and us yeah. and families are the biggest source of dissension in human history why would this be any different hey gentlemen i'm sorry ron you know we'll we'll, we'll catch up next time we're out of runway yep. we are out of show um i want to thank both my guests this morning uh, ron gerbron and tim ventura tim we definitely are going to have to keep track of this as these things progress and uh, I guess we're just going to have to have you back. Well, that's the end of this week. I'm sorry I wasn't here yesterday, but uh, computers can be very weird sometimes. Next week, I've got some potential surprises, which uh, may destabilize the paradigm even more. So until then, same time, same bat channel. Remember, third star on the left, straight on till morning.